Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about how do we study the quantum mechanics of a charged particle in a general time-dependent electromagnetic field. And so in the picture, I've drawn a single charged particle. It has charged Q, and it is in the presence of some electric field that could depend on space and time and some magnetic field. And so I'll just remind you that in classical physics, the interaction of that charged particle with the electromagnetic field would be given through the Lorentz force law. So we have an understanding that if we have the charged particle, we can calculate the force based on the electric and magnetic field at a given position and the force law is going to be equal to F is Q and then we would have the electric field evaluated at the position of the particle so let's call that X0 and then at whatever time so our, our particle is at position um, X0 and so that would be the force from the electric field on the charged particle. And then there's a force from the magnetic field on the charged particle, provided that charged particle is moving. And that looks like Q times the cross product of the velocity of the particle times the magnetic field, again, at the location of the particle. And so we have this general expression that tells us what is the force on the charged particle at any given time, and we can use that in Newton's laws to make a prediction for what the trajectory of the charged particle is going to be. Now in quantum mechanics, what we need is to know the Hamiltonian. So in order to solve the Schrodinger equation for the wave function of a particle that's interacting with the electric and magnetic fields, so our first question is, what is the Hamiltonian? And so the answer to this is going to be very useful to us, not just when we're thinking about a single charged particle interacting with electric and magnetic fields, but also if we have a collection of charged particles, for example, in an atom or a molecule, then the Hamiltonian for those would just be, um, so the, the, at least the part of it that describes the interaction of each charged particle with the electric fields and the magnetic fields um, would just be the same thing that we're going to derive here. Okay, so let's talk about how to do that. I'm gonna actually tell you what the answer is first, and then I'll just mention how you could go about deriving this Hamiltonian um, and I will give you a link to a set of notes that you can read to see all of the details there. Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand is that this Hamiltonian that I'm going to write down, it's not expressed directly in terms of the electric field and the magnetic field. It's actually expressed in terms of the scalar and vector potential for the electric and magnetic field. And so I need to just remind you about what are those and how are they related to the electric and magnetic fields. And then once we understand that, then we can write down the answer. Okay. So we recall that given any electric and magnetic field that we can write those in terms of a vector field A and a scalar field, which is just a, a, a usual function of space and time, phi. And so the way that we do it is that we can express the magnetic field as the curl of this vector field A, which is called the vector potential. And we can express the electric field as negative the gradient 
of the scalar field phi and then minus the partial derivative with respect to time of this vector potential. So you might be a little bit more familiar with just the expression E equals negative the gradient of phi. So that's always possible in electrostatics to write the electric field that way. But when you have general time dependent electromagnetic fields, then we actually need this more general expression. So the statement is that given any physically allowed electric and magnetic field, then we can write the magnetic field as the curl of some vector potential, and we can write the electric field as the negative, the gradient of the scalar potential minus the time derivative of that vector potential. Okay. And actually, there's generally not just one way to do that. It turns out there are many choices for the vector field and for the scalar field that give the same electric and magnetic fields. And so one way to see this is that we can take a scalar field and a vector field that give you a particular electromagnetic field, and we can do a certain kind of transformation on those that give you a different scalar and vector field, but end up giving you the same electric and magnetic field. And so that transformation is called a gauge transformation. So actually, let me, let me just be totally clear and write that multiple A and phi can give the same E and B, okay? And then a way to see that is that this gauge tr transformation so taking phi to phi minus the time derivative of an arbitrary function of space and time lambda and taking a goes to a minus the gradient of that same function lambda. This transformation, if you plug it in and look at how does E change, how does B change using these definitions here, what you'll find is that this doesn't change E or B. And so there are lots of options for how we represent the electric and magnetic fields in terms of the vector and scalar potentials. But for this application, it's useful to make a particular choice. So it's useful and it turns out always possible to choose our vector potential to satisfy this additional constraint that the divergence of the vector potential is equal to zero. And this is what's called Coulomb gauge. Okay. And so if we manage to represent our electric magnetic field in terms of a scalar potential and a vector potential satisfying this Coulomb gauge condition, which is it's always possible for us to, to find an appropriate scalar field and vector field that satisfy that. Um, then we can write down, finally, what is the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian? Okay. And so I'm going to write down the answer, and then I'll just mention how we get that and send you off to read the additional notes if you want to see the details. Okay. And so it turns out, in terms of this vector potential that satisfies the Coulomb gauge condition and the corresponding scalar potential, then the Hamiltonian for our charged particle in the electromagnetic field is the usual kinetic energy term, but then we also have a term which is the dot product of the momentum operator and then that vector potential. We have another term which is the vector potential squared, that is the dot product of A with itself, 
And then finally, we have a term which is the charge Q times the scalar potential. And so, of course, that's the term that we saw in the hydrogen atom Hamiltonian when we have the Coulomb potential of the proton, uh, then, we, then we just have Q times that potential. Okay, but in general, when you have general time-dependent electromagnetic fields, then we can use this full Hamiltonian. Okay, so it looks kind of complicated. One thing to emphasize is that when I write A of X and T here, then the X is actually X operator for our charged particle. Okay, so if A was just linear in X, then we replace that with an expression which is linear in the X operator. But if A is more complicated, then we might have some more complicated object, again, built from the position operator for that charged particle. Okay, um, so where does this come from? Well, it, it's using the basic idea that the Hamiltonian should be the energy operator for our system. And so one way that we can derive this is to use some of the more sophisticated methods in mechanics. And so we could start with that Lorentz force law. And so we know that in terms of uh, formulations of mechanics, so that would be useful in the Newtonian formulation of mechanics. But we can also try to write down a Lagrangian that reproduces that force law. So there's some Lagrangian we can write down if we want to do Lagrangian mechanics um, that gives rise to that force law. And then it turns out we can do that as long as the Lagrangian um, is expressed in terms of these vector and scalar potentials. Okay. Once we have the Lagrangian for the system, so we, we kind of try to choose a Lagrangian that reproduces that force law. Once we have the Lagrangian for this system, then we can derive an expression for the Hamiltonian, uh, which is sort of the classical version of our energy operator. So there's just a standard method that I'll review in the notes for going from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. And then the Hamiltonian that you end up with is basically this expression here. Okay, And I, I mentioned that by choosing this Coulomb gauge for a vector potential, um, that kind of clarifies how you go from the classical Hamiltonian to the quantum Hamiltonian. So there's a little bit of a subtlety. I'll mention that in the notes. Um, and so that's all I'll say for this video. In the next one, we're actually going to apply this Hamiltonian to start using time-dependent perturbation theory to understand probabilities for atomic and molecular transitions in the presence of electromagnetic waves. Okay, so we'll, we'll use this Hamiltonian in the case where our electric and magnetic fields are oscillating fields with some particular frequency.